Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski, and I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading, truly leading and legendary scholar in this space. Clemencia Rodriguez is professor in the Department of Media Studies and Production in the Klein College of Media and Communication at Temple University. Daniel Trielli, a doctoral candidate at the Department of Communication Studies at Northwestern and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Clemencia more properly in just a minute. I'm delighted to note that today's talk is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Ethnography Workshop in the Department of Sociology, and the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Program, all at Northwestern University. Before we go to the seminar, however, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and institutions history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me briefly say how uh, the seminar will unfold. First, Daniel will tell us more about Clemencia's research and career in just a minute. Then Clemencia will deliver her seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. Daniel will moderate reading them aloud and relaying uh, those to the speaker. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many, many thanks for joining us. Without further ado, Daniel, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Pablo. It is my distinguished pleasure to introduce Dr. Clemencia Rodriguez, who's, a, as, as Pablo said, is a professor in the Department of Media Studies and Production at Temple University. Um, in her 2001 book, Fishers in a Mediascape, Dr. Rodriguez developed a key concept for us who study media and journalism, the theory of citizens media, uh, the framework describes how community of private, communities of private citizens control and use media to meet their own needs and protect their own interests outside of traditionally, uh, traditional, traditional media and journalism. Um, based on extensive field work in her native Colombia, she wrote the fascinating book, Citizens Media Against Armed Conflict, Disrupting Violence in Colombia, published in 2000, 2011. Um, it's about citizens' media in the context of the armed conflict between drug traffickers, right-wing paramil paramilitary groups, leftist guerrilla, and the army. I am very excited to hear about uh, Professor Rodriguez's talk, and I'm sure we'll all have a lot of questions for her at the end of the talk. Professor Rodriguez, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel, for that amazing introduction. Thank you, Pablo and Mora and the Center for Latinx Media for organizing this seminar. It was such a pleasure to listen to my friends and colleagues, J.D. Rivero and Mari Castañeda in uh, past, uh, past weeks of the seminar. I would like to acknowledge that this talk is happening uh, on the traditional lands of the Lenape people here in Philadelphia, where I am now. And um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, use a PowerPoint to uh, guide my talk here. I'm hoping that you all can see that. And I'm going to start with um, some geographical and um, historical context. 
Um, what you can see in the map in, um, in the red circle is, um, is um, the region called Montes de Maria. It's located in the Colombian Caribbean. And I first came here in 2004. At the time, I came with the following research question. What is the role of citizens media in a context of war? And so this is the region, as I said, is located in the Colombian Caribbean. And it was one of the regions that was greatly impacted by armed conflict and war. So let me give you a little bit of context um, about that. And a good way to explain the war in Colombia is the Gini index, which measures inequality. It goes from zero to 100. Zero is perfect equality, meaning that most of the wealth is distributed among the great majority of the population. And a genie of 100 is perfect inequality, meaning that one person has access to 100% of the wealth produced in the country. So the greater the Gini index, the more inequality. And Colombia is one, has one of the highest Gini indexes in the world and increasing. So in 2017, the Gini index for Colombia was 49.7 and it went to 50.4 in 2018. And war in Colombia, it's all about this. And at the center of this history of inequality is the issue of land tenure and land concentration. Now the Colombian Caribbean reflects well how this happens. In this region of Montes de Maria, 75% of all the land is the, of the region is composed of large estates of more than 250 acres, while 3%, only 3% of all the land is in the, in the hands of small farmers. Now the large estates, the haciendas, are mostly cattle ranches and tobacco plantations. And I want to make a note about how these type of agribusinesses require a lot of labor. So it's in the benefit of these landowners to expropriate the small farmers so, so that they can they have to sell their labor when the when the farmers become landless. So uh, since the 1960s, uh, campesino communities have resisted this state of uh, this status quo and struggled for redistribution of the land and social change. But the elite didn't budge. Some of the campesinos movements were radicalized, becoming armed guerrillas. And the elite decided to form their own militias to protect their land and their wealth from guerrilla incursions. These militias are known as paramilitary or paras in the, in the Colombian slang or paracos. Uh, they tend to be very conservative and right-wing. As a result of these, we ended up in the middle of some, what some historians have called La Guerra de Espejos, the War of Mirrors, where civilian communities, unarmed communities, are left in the middle of this battlefield between the leftist guerrillas and the right-wing Paracos. So this is the Caribbean, a region greatly impacted by the war. Some of the worst massacres happened here just kilometers away where I was doing my field work in 2004. And so there's immense trauma. But at the same time, it is part of the Caribbean. And as, as we know, the Caribbean is a hub of creativity, especially what I call language creativity, meaning a great power of expression, humor, storytelling that involves spoken languages, body languages, ghost stories, witches, African spirituality, indigenous cultural practices, decimas, and such passion for popular culture, telenovelas, radionovelas, and uh, the relationship with community and territorio. I would like to introduce here the notion of territorio. When we talk about territorio in Colombia, what we mean is uh, we understand a geographic space, a natural world, in interaction with its human communities and their cultural practices and ancestral knowledges, 
all these frame by very specific historical contexts. So this is what we call territorio. And in the Caribbean, territorio is all about expression and languages. I finished my field work in 2006. Um, let me just show you some of the region. And when I started coming here, I understood the struggle for the land, la lucha por la tierra, because it's really an amazing place of beauty and fertility. As you can see, uh, when they open the pastures and, and tear the native forest, they leave some of the bigger trees behind so that they can offer shade for the cattle. So this is the land in dispute. Um, so I, can, I finished the work in 2006, but I never stopped coming back. And I'm going to appropriate here a term that I first heard from Mari Castañeda just a couple of weeks ago on the same foros, forum. I came back again and again to Tamaliar. I came back to be a juror in a local community film and video festival. I came back to lead field trips, the last one of which was after the IMCR conference held in Cartagena. We took a group of about 20 international communication scholars to this region to meet with different community communication initiatives. I came back to hang out, to help a community radio station at some point, to visit community leaders who were in lockdown to, due to death threats. I have developed keen relationships in the region. It's been 15 years of being present in the region and I don't wanna paint a rosy picture. Sometimes is there, we've gone through rocky times. Uh, there's been ups and downs, moments where the trust is challenged. There's been moments where we've had to repair the relationship. But in some, this presence in the region explains in part why in 2018 I was able to embark on a new initiative. So this is uh, 2018 with two colleagues, Juan Salazar from the University of Western Sydney and Marta C. Romero from uh, the Universidad Autónoma del Caribe in Barranquilla. We went back to the region, Marta C. and I had been involved in a couple of historical memory projects in the region. Juan was uh, deeply involved in uh, environmental issues and environmental research. So we wanted to start a project of, uh, of um, environmental communication and historical memory in the region. The, the original idea was to document how the war had left its scars and trauma not on the human communities, but in the natural environment. And we convened six community organizations in Montes de Maria to, to talk about this project and see if they were interested in pursuing this with us. And we convened a first workshop in 2018. And at the res as a result, it was very clear that the community organizations were not interested. They were not interested in looking towards the past and working about the past. They wanted to focus on the future and, um, and they were interested to work with us, but not in this project. So one thing it was clear for us, and it was that we were committed to non-extractive knowledge. We were against mining, uh, the, the research as a mining endeavor. So we, we shelved the project and we started from scratch, went back to the drawing board, and we started cooking the project together, together with the six uh, community organizations from the beginning. And from this interaction between the six community organizations and this uh, team of three academics, what emerged was that they were had tremendous expertise in the area of um, environmental activism but in, in, in the areas of media and communication, they were quite pre precarious. They didn't have the skills and the expertise. So the new goal for the project became to strengthen the activist media and communication skills. We, re, we enlisted the help of, of other colleagues. We, uh, we invited Omar Rincon from Universidad de los Andes who's an expert on media narratives and, and communication and genres, formats, et cetera. 
We invited Camilo Perez and Jair Vega from Universidad del Norte in Barranquilla. Uh, they have a tremendous expertise when, in, when it comes to media production and um, edutainment, things like that. And so we kind of expanded the team. So some of the work, so since 2018, we have been going back to the region to workshop media and communication, always centered on local environmental issues. Some of the work centers on media production skills, editing, learning to use software to produce radio, video, et cetera. But the most relevant moments happen when we share theory and research. So we did sessions on Jesus Martin Barbero's work on mediations. We, Juan told them everything he knows about speculative fiction. We talked about the critique of the colonial project and epistemologies of the South. I did some work on the feminism of Gloria and Saldúa. And we also shared scholarly work on media narratives, matrices culturales, and how popular culture connects with audiences. And so what, um, what happened is that we started seeing these environmental activists shifting, shifting the way they think about how to communicate with their audiences and how to construct their media products and their, and their media processes. And so I want to share with you some of the examples. For example, one of the groups decided to design a whole campaign around um, the issue of protecting the riverbanks of a local river using El Mohan, which is a river ghost that is traditional to the cultura popular of this region. And so they, uh, they constructed a kind of a street theater performance uh, with the Mohan and the river and, uh, and all kinds of storytelling and ghost stories to, to uh, promote the protection of the riverbanks. Another group used um, local obscene language, that type of everyday language that is so common in the Caribbean, to promote rainwater har harvesting. And this was a hilarious video that they produced. Uh, it was full of humor and local languages. And uh, at the center of it, it was the value of, um, of, of harvesting rainwater instead of buying water or dealing with the government uh, in ter terms of trying to get a, a, a water system in the town or the small vereda in the rural, rural areas. Um, another group produced a radio novela that uh, some of the characters in the radio novela had, uh, were witches, and there was a story about a toad that, uh, that connected with some popular knowledge and stories about how toads are able to predict when it's gonna rain or not. And I just, I captured this tiny bit of their, uh, of their experience producing this radio novela. Okay, so you see the dynamic and the talk about the brujas. Uh, we, had the, we have done some workshopping also how to produce a script. And so they were using all these, uh, all these new skills gained during the workshop. But what, what was very interesting to me was the, 
the shift into tapping into the local knowledges, the, the ghost stories, the ancestral knowledges of the region. Um, whoops, sorry. Okay. Um, so what we learned was that our expertise and knowledge have a place in this type of interaction, that sharing the theories on the critique of the colonial project, for example, or talking about epistemologies of the South, or the value of speculative fiction can empower local knowledges, that these concepts and theories can and should inform activist practice, that they should be uh, become embodied in this activist practice towards, towards, in this case, environmental local issues. I'd like to share with you another, uh, another kind of a, a instance of this field work um, and some lessons learned also uh, at, during, during this project. As you can see in this map, the region where we work is mostly lowlands but there are some mountainous areas, and it's usually the case in Colombia, geography has everything to do with the war. When the landowners formed their paramilitary militias, they, these took over the lowlands and pushed the, the guerrillas to the mountain areas. For the guerrillas, the mountains are beneficial because they can hide. It's very forested in the mountain areas. There's no pastures, and so it's easier to hide. As a result, uh, the result of years of years of this conflict between the guerrillas and the paramilitaries is that the mountain areas um, uh, have become known as guerrilla spaces and the lowlands as paraco spaces, meaning that all communities uh, from the mountains were stigmatized as uh, guerrillas and everybody from the lowlands was stereotyped as a paramilitary or a paraco. And this came crashing down on our project. When we convened the first workshop in 2018, at some point we received a call from one of the community organizations from the mountain area. They told us that they did not feel comfortable coming down and spending three days with the lowland people in the lowlands. They said uh, of the natural reserve where we were planning to stay. And I'm quoting, quoting here, if they survived the war is because they most probably had dealings with the Paracos. Uh, it became a very stressful situation. We mediated between the mountain organizations and the lowland organizations. And at the end, the mountain people agreed to come back down to the lowlands where we had organized the workshop. But the first day, the atmosphere was very tense. It was not good. Everyone was very reserved. The dialogue did not flow. You could really feel the tension. That night, the people from Reserva Sanguare, where we were staying, um, said that because it was a moonless night, it was perfect to go see the luminescent plankton. And I don't know how many of you have, uh, have, have had the opportunity to see this amazing um, phenomenon, but it's, some, it's plankton that lives in certain parts of the ocean. And when you move them or something moves them, they kind of, uh, they, they project a light that is kind of almost like neon light. So the reserve uh, people who were also part of the workshops told us to be um, on, on the beach at 8 o'clock p.m. only with our swimsuits and that we were going to go see the plankton. So we, um, we went uh, to, the, on the, to the side of the ocean and um, I cannot tell you the fear of the mountain people because it's pitch dark, it's the middle of the night and we're getting them in canoes to go into the open sea. But uh, the reserve people were very reassuring. We all had our life vests and, uh, and the, the leaders of this trip in to see the plankton uh, told the, the mountain people that they were gonna get in a canoe with one of the most expert um, canoe people and you know, oh, this, uh, water person. And so that they, 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 they didn't have anything to worry about. So they took us on the open ocean and then we, we rode to, towards a little canal that went inland 
we went on the little canal until we got to a lagoon and there they tied the canoes one to another in kind of a U shape and they told us to jump in the water and I, the experience is absolutely formidable to see how your body interacts with the plankton and then it's all like stars. Uh, it's like your body's covering stars. And then if you float and you look up, the, the sky is full of stars also because, you know, there's no light, there's no moonlight. And so we were all experiencing this fascinating um, uh, the, the scenario. Uh, and then I, I just decided to swim a little bit like apart from everyone. And what I found is that one of the leaders in the, um, uh, of the reserve, the lowland reserve, was helping one of the young women from the mountains because she didn't know how to swim. She had been one of the most nervous one, ones and he was holding her and teaching her how to float. And little by little, she started to relax and relax. And, and, the, and then he kept saying, don't worry, I got you, I got you, just relax and float. And this is the first step for you to start learning to swim, how to swim. And to me, it was like peace building in the making. I could see that this trust that was emerging here was, um, was breaking down the stereotypes and the stigmas that they, can, they had come uh, about the other um, they had come with about the other. And in this moment, those stereotypes and those stigmas just broke in a thousand pieces and disappeared. Obviously, the workshop, the second day and third day of the workshops were amazing. And to this day, we all have a WhatsApp group in which we are all the time in communication. And, you know, the communication started flowing very freely between the people of the mountain and the people from the lowlands. What became clear in all these, and with this I'm going to conclude, is that these new forms of knowledge, these uh, new forms of understanding the world, of relating to each other, appear when the project was able to open new spaces where different subjects, bodies, and experiences engage in interaction with the non-human world, when bodies open up to the other, when we each allow ourselves to be co-produced, co-created by the other. Those of us from the mountains opened up to those of us from the lowlands. The human bodies opened up to interacting with the plankton. We, the academics, opened up towards activists and community leaders, and they opened up to interact with our theories. And at some point, we all understood that we were all producers of new knowledge. The problem, the way I see it, is that academic languages are not good enough to capture all these knowledges that, uh, or these new forms of peace, of peaceful coexistence, that are very ephemeral and that are not rational and emerge in the moment. As Boaventura dos Santos says, quote, half of this book will remain forever unwritten. We need languages and storytelling that embrace the presence of bodies, of territorios, the presence of feelings, sensations, desires, intuitions, as researchers, we need to pay attention to the ephemeral processes of construction of knowledge that arise from the interactions between bodies, body and territorio, body and ancestors. Um, and so because of COVID, it made it impossible to travel back to Colom the Colombian Caribbean all of 2020. We had to cancel several trips. We were totally heartbroken. And this feeling of alienation, it was this feeling of alienation that made us use the time to rethink, to relearn, always in dialogue and interaction. So from May to August of 2020, we started something we called La Cosa, referring to COVID and everything that was descending on, on us. And it was this Cosa. And so uh, the team of academics 
uh, with others from Universidad Iberoamericana de Puebla have been meeting since May of 2020 for every week to explore how we do this, how we shift academia. We've explored um, um, uh, all kinds of different themes such as epistemicide, decolonizing research, indigenous epistemologies. We think that there's great hope in incorporating indigenous epistemologies to be able to document and and capture and understand all these new forms of knowledges that are born in territorio. We explore issues of territorio and cuerpo and all in the framework of trying to produce non-extractive knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm virtually speechless after the trove of of the information and questions that I think some questions are popping up and I certainly have a lot of them. Uh, and I'm gonna take my privilege as the Q and A person to ask the first question, but I'll, I promise I'll stick to one. So if anyone in the audience has any questions you can ask in the Q and A thing um, and, and I'll get to you. My question is, one of my questions is um, the, this is a very interesting project. These are very interesting projects and are, they're very um, interesting the way that the, the, the knowledge building is collaborated amongst everyone. And there's also people from different institutions. And my question is, how do you, what are the, the, the institutional and maybe funding challenges to that? Um, how do we, I mean, I, I'm coming into academia as, as a, you know, soon to be graduated uh, doctor. Uh, how do we go about in funding and building the structure to, 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 for a project like that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, it's been very difficult to, to find funding actually um, I think Juan Salazar is, um, you know, he's, he's, he's always, he has a long history of getting grants, but when we started writing grants to fund this project, we couldn't get any. And so for him, it was like, whoa, why, what's happening here? Because that's not usually what happens to him. I'm kind of used to it because there's always been uh, my, my story. Um, so we found allies in um, Latin America, for example, uh, FES Comunicación, which is the Frederick Ever Foundation. It's a German foundation that, um, that has a lot of work in, um, in all of Latin American countries and especially in media and communication. And so, um, so FES Comunicación has been key and uh, we've learned to do things very cheap. That's the other thing. And uh, we all, the, the academic, most of the funding goes towards uh, funding the activists, transportation, lodging, et cetera. And the academics, we, we, we for example, we uh, combine a trip to Colombia with a symposium at Universidad del Norte so that we can ask our universities to fund the trip to Colombia uh, because we're going to present our research at Universidad del Norte in Barranquilla, you know, with those things like that. But it's very challenging. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have very optimistic answer to give you. Um, the other thing is that um, when Mari Castañeda um, presented her work, my question, which kind of emerged out of this work, is, uh, you know, it's it's all very uh, good and and well when when most of the researchers involved in this work are full professors, and so, uh, but what happens when with younger academics? How do we push them through tenure and promotion with this kind of work? And her answer to my question was really interesting where within the university, 
Mari and her team of colleagues are pushing for the criteria uh, towards tenure and production to expand and embrace, uh, you know, this kind of work, which is obviously very different from the typical traditional scholarly work where you produce a journal article, send it to a peer review uh, publication, and then, you know, get your points towards tenure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions in the Q&A box that are, that are related. So I'm going to start with the first one that is a little bit more conceptual and move to the second one after you answer, which is more uh, practical. Uh, they're both about the non-extractive knowledge. Uh, and the first comes from our Dean and CEO of the Qatar, North, Northwestern in Qatar, Dr. Crady, saying, asking, can knowledge truly be, truly ever be non-extractive? What are the limits of this metaphor? And if you could elaborate on that. So that's the more conceptual question about non-extractive knowledge. Okay. Um, um, Marwan, hello. We miss you here in Philadelphia. Marwan is a, one of my best friends and he left us here. Okay, so... Um, by extractive knowledge, what I mean is the type of, you know, traditional anthropological research that goes into the community to mine data and doesn't leave anything in the community. And so um, I've never really asked myself the question if it can be absolutely non-extractive. But um, I think it, it, it can be non-extractive in that traditional sense of the term, where if you, if, you, if, you keep, if you keep at the center of your project the notion that the most important thing is the hard capacidad instalada, as they say, in, they say in Colombia, is like to leave the knowledge in the region instead of taking it out of the region and, and not leaving anything in the region. Um, I mean, to me, this project demonstrates that it can be done, but um, you have to be convinced that, uh, that what you want to do is that, and you don't care if you don't get anything publishable out of the research project. You don't care if, uh, if, um, if, if the, nothing uh, happens towards your own research pipeline, as they say, in, uh, in, in our departments, in, in our academic circles. I mean, basically, you really ch have to change channels and uh, switch channels and work towards goals that may have nothing to do with your academic career or your research pipeline or your journal articles and all that stuff. And that's what I worry that, you know, for us at the full professor level, it's easy to do that, but if you're an assistant professor or if you're a doctoral student, so I think it's for us to also switch, change or pressure academic um, criteria and academic circles to, to embrace uh, the notion that knowledge happens in many different ways and not just in journal articles. And this is a, actually a great segue to the more practical question that comes from Tomas Guarna, a grad student at NM MIT. And the question is, could you share some specific lessons learned or some practic practical generalizable guidelines for non-extractive media research? Uh, he says he's interested in your experience building trust and an aligning incentives. Is that a practical framework to think about? Yeah, I was thinking when I was preparing this, there's a lot that I didn't, I didn't include. But um, I, I think it's all about the relationship that you build uh, with the community organizations and the communities and the region. And, um, and the trust is too abstract. It doesn't say anything. It's made of very specifics. So um, when I didn't go into all this, but you know, those 15 years of establishing that relationship with the community organizations in the region are about being at their service, whatever they need. So I can 
I can list so many things that I've done because I'm on call all the time. So they need translating um, captions in a short video into English. So I drop everything and translate that. They need um, an evaluation report or help with some kind of evaluation report that they need to submit to donors who, you know, they got a grant from so and so. Uh, and so I help do that. I help translate documents into English or from English to Spanish. I write recommendation letters. Um, I connect uh, uh, the community organizations with potential funders. I, but the thing is, to the the I, I think the most important thing is the act of being on call and the um, the um, availability. Where you know it doesn't matter how busy you are or what your uh, to do list is. You you drop stuff because someone in the, in the Monte de Maria needs this, or a community organization needs that, or the community radio station needs this other thing. And so I would say that towards the non-extractive knowledge, uh, one of the main things is the type of relationship and the quality of the fabric of the, the relationship that you build with the region and its people, and how much you're willing to work I think when people see that you're working, that, that, you're, that your labor is going towards um, their benefit, that is a huge uh, source of, of trust and, 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 um, uh, and yeah, and positive into that relationship that will lead to non-extractive knowledge. This, this is a fascinating point. And just as, as an aside, uh, Mona has a question that I'm, I'm going to call, but I have to say that as, as a researcher who, who does stuff more at scale about digital communities or digital exhaust data, that also makes me think of, of, the, of the availability that even us more you know, quantitative computational researchers also have a responsibility to, to help the communities that we study as well and how we can do that. So that was very good. Uh, Mona has a question now that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm dying to hear. So Mona, please. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Professor Rodriguez, for this most insightful presentation. I have a question um, that relates um, to bringing communication tools to local communities. Let's call them modern communication tools to local communities. I recently um, listened to some presentations, or actually they were ethnographies, um, that raised critical questions as to this um, implicit benchmark, uh, according to which all areas of the world would need to be connected to the internet, have mobile devices, have computers, etc. And they were, these ethnographies that I, that I listened to, these seminars, they were saying how different local communities and different social groups might have completely different understandings in relation to their need to be connected, for instance. So uh, again, these, these ethnographers were trying to critically interrogate this uh, global discourse around bringing connectivity uh, worldwide, right? So I, I was just wondering, when you were talking about your environmental communication project, at some point you said something like, uh, some of the tools that we had in relation to certain media or communication technologies would be were useful for this community. So I was just wondering how you problematize that. How was what's your reaction uh, uh, to this critical uh, response to the uh, again commercial, public, uh, worldwide discourse of saying we have to bring connectivity to everyone. That's what everyone wants. Thank you in advance. Yeah, thank you for that question. Actually, we don't do anything digital. Zero. And actually, when Pablo first invited me to the seminar, because the center is called um, Center for Digital Media, I said, I have nothing, you know, I'm not digital. Um, and so, um, yeah, so the, the media skills that I was talking about are more developing a script editing video, editing radio, there's a radio station, there's a, um, you know, 20 year old 
community radio station in the region. So we're, um, and the reason we're not doing anything digital is that there's no connectivity. The infrastructure is pathetic in the region. And so it's useless. Uh, actually, the only way to communicate in our group of, uh, of academics and community organizations is WhatsApp. We cannot even use email because especially the people in the mountains, in the mountain areas, um, they don't, they have internet once in a while and many, many times they don't even have electricity. You know, it comes and goes as the infrastructure is quite, quite precarious. And so, so no one feels the need to learn anything digital because why if we don't have the infrastructure to use it? And um, so I, but they communicate. That, that is obvious, right? I mean, all communities communicate. And so we focus on that. What are the communication and information needs of these community organizations? It's all based on needs and it's all based on the resources that already exist there. So, you know, storytelling is a resource that exists there. So we work with that. We work with uh, scripts, we work with photography, with uh, street theater and performance, because that's something that can be easily done in small communities and it doesn't require any type of connectivity. Uh, we work with radio because uh, first it can, there's the radio station, but it, uh, it can also be taken into, for example, loudspeakers. Loudspeakers are still widely used in this type of rural communities in Colombia as a, as a medium. And so the church always have a loudspeaker system and it can be used to, you know, to, uh, to broadcast a local radio novela. Um, and so we're always working with the resources that are available and the communication and information needs that emerge from the knowledge that the community organizations have of their own communities. So the knowledge about who's going to be the audience for these, what, how to reach this audience or that audience with what communication and media resources. All that is done together. The diagnosis is done together with the community organizations who know the region much better than any of us academics can know the region. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I actually uh, have a, a question that is also related to that because listening to your to your talk, uh, I, I, was th I was thinking about how different territories can emerge from different places and spaces, right? We have, I mean, it's certainly inspiring to take that framework and take it to Rio in my home country of Brazil, in which there is a conflict, which is not an out, out, out war, but also thinking about how the digital space can be a territory. I mean, it's it's that it's that quote like you give someone a hammer and and all they see are nails and that's why me and Mora are always asking about digital communication because that's that's our space but it's very inspiring and and certainly applicable I guess to find these territories in, in the digital space. Right. Yeah. I absolutely. I really find the notion of territorio. Um, illuminating and, um, and it has to do with geography. The Colombian geography is one of the most broken geographies in the, on the planet. And, uh, and there's so many human phenomena, Colombian human phenomena that is explained uh, by the geography. So the Andean mountain range, when, when it arrives to the south of Colombia is one, but then it divides in three. And so we have the Western mountains, the middle mountains and the Eastern mountains. So everything is mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. And so it's very, very broken to build a uh, roads and highways infrastructure in Colombia has been, has been Herculean. And, uh, and so for many, many, uh, uh, years and centuries, uh, communities that can be 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers away, 
were days away because of the of the broken geography. And so that means that there's so many kind of tiny regions in Colombia that have their own specificities because communication and interaction between people, it's very, it has traditionally been very, very different, uh, difficult. So it has produced these territorios that are distinct in their racial configuration, uh, history, how armed conflict has impacted that territorio, the cultural practices, the cultura popular, the spirituality and different hybridities that have happened in each one. And so, um, and so that notion of territorio, so Colombia is basically made out of hundreds of different territorios that are very, very different. And so it's, um, it's been a really kind of a useful idea to, to, uh, to delve into this notion of territorio to understand uh, the country and the human, the human side of the country and the interaction between, between the human world and the natural world. Yeah, very inspiring. We have a question now from Facundo. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Professor Rodriguez. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation. Um, and I have a question uh, I'm, I, I found really interesting uh, your uh, reference to uh, the way that we should create knowledge uh, based on the interaction with non-humans and, and the, this idea of like the embodied knowledge and, and the relationship with humans and objects also and, and, and the environment. Uh, and I was thinking if you, are, um, if you can elaborate a little more about uh, and if you are thinking in particular theories, I, I was thinking in uh, pragmatic sociology, for instance, but also in, I don't know, uh, phenomenology or uh, Malio Ponti ideas of embodied um, embodiedness. And the second one, and, and I think is um, probably related, is um, you, uh, this idea of territorial and also uh, you mentioned this concept of uh, ephemeral peace or, or the ephemerality. And I was thinking that I think that there are two uh, productive relations are our dimensions like time and, and time and space dimensions to think um, decolonizing theory, but also the production from the global south. Do uh, you think that uh, it, these two concepts could be paired to to understand like uh, yeah this uh, or, or, or or to generate a uh, decolonizing theory from the south? Thank you in advance. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that great question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, I think that's that's the whole point. Um, I my my approach or my own trajectory towards these embodied knowledge comes more from feminist theory, and uh, especially the work of feminists like Gloria Saldua and Audre Lorde, who insist again and again that, that um, feminist theory is about experience and experience is about body. So there's a shift, there's a transitioning from the Cartesian rational knowledge towards, towards a knowledge or an understanding of knowledge that embraces the strong and central presence of the body and all aspects of the body um, not, you know, the sensorial part of experience, the intuition, imagination, uh, feelings, sensations, desire, you know, all as instruments of knowledge making and meaning making. And so in that sense, uh, that's where I come from. I know the work of Marlo Ponti. I think there's many entry points. There's not just one. Queer theory could be another entry point and all that centrality of desire that is so beautiful about queer theory. So queer theory could be one entry point. Feminist, uh, radical feminist could be another. Marlo Ponti could be another. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking of that wonderful work by George Bataille on the body. Uh, that could be another entry point. You know, there's many entry points, but I think the, the ultimate goal is the same, it's to, to decolonize knowledge and to, um, 
to uh, expand our understanding of what is knowledge and who produces knowledge. And uh, obviously, when we merge that movement towards decolonizing knowledge with epistemologies of the South, then you know the sky's the limit because then we we're we're embracing all kinds of understanding of everything and connecting with different understandings. I mean, for me to read um, uh, Jaime, I'm forgetting his last name, Jaime Gutierrez. Um, you know, the, from Mexico has been so illuminating. He's, he's uh, based on his indigenous uh, uh, knowledge, um, how he understands freedom, community, work, uh, fiesta, partying. You know, it's, 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 it's very illuminating and, uh, and leads to totally new versions of what it is to be human and different understandings of the world. I was, as um, so I think it's Boaventura de Sosa Santos who says, uh, Western understandings of the world are not enough to understand the world. Thank you very much. You so much. Finally, we have a question from Pablo. Hello, Clemencia. This was a fascinating uh, presentation. I have a ton of questions. Um, we only have a few minutes, so I'm, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna try to tackle an aspect that I think uh, hasn't been discussed um, a lot, which has to do with power and politics. Um, uh, you know, the colonial project is a project of oppression; it's a project of power asymmetries, right? So, what, what you are uh, offering as an alternative, as a wonderful alternative, is a political project of much less asymmetry of power. Um, uh, however, um, it is always difficult to have absence of conflict um, in a human collectives. So, um, so I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on the political dimension of this project and whether in the fieldwork you encounter situations of conflict because there were different viewpoints and different interests uh, represented and, and how a non-extractive uh, mindset allowed a, you know, different uh, tackling of conflict and power dynamics? Yeah, oh my God, that's a very complex question. Um, so politically, we're all on the same boat, all the academics and, and all the, um, the community organizations, meaning that, for example, there's not one single Uribista among us. There's not one single defender of the cattle ranches among us. I mean, we're, you know, and it, that just happened to be that way. But also we align, we are all obviously aligned with our environmental agendas and uh, agendas of inclusion and diversity and peace building. We don't believe in war, we don't believe in weapons, well, that's like a commonality among us. So in that sense, there's no conflict uh, where, you know, as soon as you inhabit Colombia, I mean, you take a taxi and you're gonna be in conflict and you go buy bread and, you know, conflict because the country is totally divided. But somehow when you, when you uh, the way this, this project kind of emerged organically, there was already solidarity networks among the people who joined the project. So it makes sense that we don't encounter that type of political conflict. On the other hand, we've had to deal with issues of, for example, uh, in one of the workshops, one of the young women, uh, her boyfriend kind of came and crashed our taller, our workshop and took her away. You know, I mean, issues of, gender oppression that we're, we were left. I mean, there was clearly a conflict there and there was not much that we could do. You know, I mean, we, we confronted the conflict. We, when she left, we talked about it and how awful it was that she had to go when she didn't want to go clearly. But, you know, this young man, I mean, they were both very young, but he felt entitled to take her away and she felt that she had to go. And so sometimes the conflict emerges and there's not much we can do. Um, and uh, 
Other times there's been conflict in that the right wing forces in the region uh, threaten the community activists that we're working with. And so we confront that conflict too. And uh, we deal with it in many different ways. Sometimes, you know, we're raising funds at the last minute to help someone leave the region and go to Bogota or to Barranquilla for a few weeks until things calm down or, you know, things like that. I mean, it's like ad hoc uh, when it happens and, and depending on each situation. But yeah, I mean, conflict emerges all the time and we, we just like navigate each one differently. And there's always like, what resources do we have? How can we contribute with those resources? But I have to say many times it's like, we have no resources. There's not much we can do. Right, all right. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting basic observation. And again, thank you very much for fascinating an absolutely cutting edge uh, seminar. Um, thank you, Danielle, for great moderation as always, uh, to our audience for staying with us uh, to the end, a couple of minutes after the end. And uh, I invite everybody uh, to join us again next week uh, when Victor Garcia Perdomo uh, from Universidad de La Sabana in Bogota uh, will talk to us about his research. Have a great uh, rest of your days and thank you again, Clemencia. Thank you.